What's up, everybody? Welcome back to this week's episode of the Antler Up Podcast. And on the other line, I'm joined by none other, one of my best friends. I got Tim Seasock on the other line. Tim, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, man. Thanks again for having me on. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Dude, it is uh, two weeks. Well, this will be the second podcast in what, uh, like three weeks for, for us, which is kind of cool, kind of great. I, I kind of like that, that uh, we're doing this one again, and I'm excited to to have this conversation because, man, we went to Utah in fall of 2020. What's so up? that was already going to be four years ago. And even prior to that, we were already hanging out and talking about stuff. So about five years ago is when we kind of started talking and, you know, getting a chance to, to know each other, even though we grew up in the same town. And you finally pulled your, your kind of dream hunt. And I've gone on the podcast plenty of times of dropping your name, talking about like those Western hunts about, oh man, Tim loves going after mule deer even more so than elk and along those lines. And here we are sitting on May 30th you got the, the hunt that you've been hoping to do and pull and, and draw the last man. It seems like every year that, that we've been talking about this five, five years now and you pulled it. And what tag is that? What's so- up? <laughs> Number one, like I'm, I'm still like riding that night because this just happened yesterday. So yeah, <laughs> it went from, you know, at, well, let me back up a little bit. So I was sitting at work and I have a couple screens at my desk. So I just had my personal email pulled up on the on the the third screen that I have off to my right. And I've been thinking about it for like two days, and I've been constantly checking. I'm like, man, it's not coming through. And then I was checking the CD, CDW site to see like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What is my, what is the status of it within the website? Cause you know, emails could be delayed. And then, uh, you know, I got like stuck in a meeting or something and like, I didn't watch it for a while. And then I looked over and as I looked over, it just like popped up and like right in the, right in the, the subject of the email told me I was successful on my first choice. And I'm like, what's up? I did like a double take, man. It was like, yeah. no way. And then I was like, all right, then I got to check the credit card. I got to check yeah, the CDW site, make sure this isn't like a fluke. And uh, I don't think it is, man, because they, they <laughs> charge me for it. So, uh, but yeah, so I rode that high right into the, to the later in the night, I had a hockey game. I think I played like the best game of my season so far. It was like nice. five goals and three assists on our team's like total eight goal. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it, it was wild. And then, you know, I've, I've still been walking around with this huge smile on my face, but What's up? Um, this hunt is uh, high country mule deer. You have to be above ten thousand feet in the wilderness area. Um, I don't want to say it's like one of these premium tags that you wait fifteen years for because it's not bad, but it is a tag that, as you mentioned, like I've been trying to pull this same tag for five years and have been just accumulating an extra preference point every year. And every year, it just seems like there is so much point creep. Or, you know, you can never tell how many people that have points above you that then jump in on this hunt to try and pull it. So What's up? I'll be doing it solo um, as it looks. You know, I'm the only one that put in for the tag. Um, <laughs> Tom and I tried for it, I think, two years ago um, Yeah, together, thinking that we'd have better odds as a party application, too. And it never turned out. But so, again, I, you know, it's what's that? You know, they got a good population there. Um, it was somewhat out of the winter kill area and, uh, you know, from two years ago. So I, I don't think it'll be a problem getting on deer. It's, you know, it's going to be trying to find the right buck, you know, I'm hoping yeah, no that's doubt. what it amounts yeah. to. <laughs> well, dude, no doubt about it that you'll, you'll find them and, and we'll, we're going to, that's what the main premises of this episode is going to be, uh, for everybody listening and watching is going to be like, what's up? You pull what's that up? tag. Cause this is that time frame. Like this is right now, like about what last week people in Kansas were pulling Utah, you know, we're, all, all the different States that you have to put in for it's right around that time that you start uh, getting that either successful email or the, unfortunately now you got a preference point email basically. So the main premises of this episode is going to be you pull your tag. Now what? And the reason why one, I think it's great timing. Number one, number two, Tim has been doing this now for many years. I, I mean, Tim, your first elk hunt was what ten years ago. I I would probably say maybe even further past that by now. 
Yeah, What's 10, up? 11 years I've been doing it. I'm trying to yeah, do it so every I year, mean, and I missed a year in there, year or two in there, but yeah, pretty much a decade. I, right, so so I wanted to have, and we've we've done episodes, like we've had Tom on, like getting you, and Tim, you even, even touched upon like, getting ready, like what's your process of getting things in line as far as points goes and everything like that. But we never, never, I don't think did a really good in depth episode of you pull it now what? And I think a lot of what, hopefully what we're going to talk about will not only translate into like a mule deer hunt, obviously for you, particularly with this hunt, but someone hunting elk, someone hunting antelope, someone going after whitetail in a different state. So you're going to be able like, to, I think, to pull a lot of the information from this and apply it to really any hunt that, that you, you know, if you drew that, that out of state tag. But man, before we do that, how happy now are you that you went to Montage Mound with us and we're using that slider and shooting at 80, 100, 100 yards? <laughs> About it. I mean, uh, that, this tag, I didn't mention, but this tag is early rifle. Um, but okay. I'm, st- I'm still happy just to be on the mountain and be able to get some physical fitness in. Obviously, shooting, you know, anytime you could shoot the bow with friends is, is worth it. So. Um, yeah, no doubt about it. And that dude, and, and that even like allows you to start getting that heart rate up a little bit, shoot in front of friends and, and like things that we talked about on that episode. And and even though, like I said, you're going to be using the a rifle, that's all right. It, it's still going to be that same, that same feeling of, okay, I'm 10,000 feet up here and I got to make this, you know, if you find only a handful of deer, you know, a, a mule deer that you're going after, you know, that, that will definitely for sure come play a role in that one. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this before we dive down that. The other thing that's kind of kicking around right now that's obviously the hot topic is this whole Iowa trail camera stuff. Have you know have you kept up with any of it? Did they ban it? I did I remember seeing something about it. But. Yeah, dude, you and I are in the same boat. Like we just if we're not going, we're I, it's not that I don't pay attention and I know I should pay more attention to it. So basically, on public land it seems like you cannot leave a trail camera overnight in the state of Iowa and, and there's more specifics to it. And I think also like with that, you can't be somewhere in the vicinity of it while you're hunting. Again, I, I need to do a better job with school, everything else that I got going on. I, other priorities were, were taken over to under fully understand to kindly kind of speak upon it, I guess. But uh, that's kind of my understanding to this point and gist. And uh, I'm anxious to hear what Dan Johnson is going to, because I think he has someone coming on the podcast uh, from the DNR out in mm-hmm. Iowa that's actually going to be able to speak clearly upon that. So, but man, that I, I don't. Obviously, we. My thing is like with all that type of stuff. And for and, me personally, it's kind of like, and if you're if that's the rule, you just got to deal with it, right? Like it, like right. it sucks uh, for some things. It sucks. Like, don't get me wrong. It's like, oh, you know, it's the same reason why we have to get up and go to work. Like the, the, our employer tells us what time we have to be at work, right? I mean, it may, we may not like it, but we have to do it. It's a kind of, I think it's in that same realm. Right. I, I guess my take on it is um, if I didn't use trail cameras or you took them away or something, I'm still going to hunt as much as I do. I'm still going to hunt the areas that I I that I've previously put cameras in, you know, that I previously hunted because something else drew me into that area. I don't right. think it would change anything for me. I really don't. I think what it adds is, you know, there's obviously value there to have that that data, but mm-hmm. it's not going to actually change. I don't think it's going to change my outcome, and I don't think it's going to change, um, you know, how much or the drive that I have behind why I hunt, when I hunt, yeah. what I hunt, et cetera. So... Yeah, in my like if, P, if Pennsylvania turned around and said, "Yeah, no more trail cameras," I'd look at it as, "Well, you know, my weekends in the summer are pretty free now, you know, because I'm usually yeah. jumping around trying to get them out." And yeah, it's gr- it's great when you get a good buck on camera and stuff, and you you get that excitement of what could be. Um, yeah. But if I didn't have that, you know, come the first day, I'm still going to have the same amount of excitement that yeah, I would have. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt about that. And I, I agree more with you. Now, I, man, I wish there would be some way. Like, and, do you know, like when you fill out the uh, harvest report and you like, you know, did you like for especially I'm thinking like more so for 
and so for a turkey because that's without the season we just wrapped up you know to ask you how how many inch spurs and uh and and you know was it a jake by answering like was it a full fan or and all that type of stuff i would love to have some sort of way where they could get data of saying like did you use a trail camera to aid in the successful of this hunt you know the success of this hunt it, and and you know I, at that I would love to see that because for me personally, dude, a trail camera has never aided in me killing a, a buck. Right. And I mean, to this point, and, uh, and it has not aided in, in my success. Now you do go on social media and you'll see someone be like, oh, I saw that he walked by this camera and I was able to sneak behind. Like there, were, I feel like those situations are more so they're they're close to someone's house they're close that like they're there's someone's property where they're able to they know like the back of their hand and they're able to sneak in there and, and do that you know what i mean yeah i think i mean i have a handful of bucks on the wall here that i have like i have pictures of on camera but right. to say that it aided me in killing the buck i you know it's hard to say you know because right i'm going in that spot for and, and i only use yeah Exactly. And I only started using a, a couple cell cams last year. So it's not even like, right. I may, I, I may have shot that buck and then been like, oh yeah, look, he was on camera a week ago, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah, to say that it aids in that, I think, I think those are pretty few and far between, but it's funny you talk about the harvest reports. Cause I think, I think PA is improving. Um, mm-hmm. Like previously, I don't ever remember, um, up until maybe a year or two ago, ever having to go in there at the, that, much detail about turkeys um mm-hmm. and then you know because they never asked for spurs and beard and full fan versus jake it was just like you killed a bird what wmu was it um, and time and, that, and yeah and that was it yeah it was date right. time and what where where'd you kill it <clears throat> and uh and so i do like that they're looking for more information but when you talk about the west and you have to fill out harvest reports whether you you um, harvest an animal or not, you have to fill it out. If you buy a tag and in most states out west, you have to fill out a harvest report. And they are asking you, how many days did you hunt? What units did you hunt? Um, you know, how many animals did you see? Did you see this? Did you see that? Like there is, I mean, it, it takes you a good 10, 15 minutes to fill it out. There's a deadline on when these have to be completed. You, obviously you, you should complete it within I think seven to ten days if you harvest something but if you don't you still have a, a deadline that you have to complete this for and if you don't complete it they won't give you a license next year like, it is that strict um, and you really gotta it, it's nice though because you dive into you know we talk about the process and we'll go through it but all that data is then out there to Dames. help right. everybody else in their hunts and to also help um, obviously the wildlife services to make the appropriate decisions on managing whatever game, you know, those reports are done against. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why you have platforms like go wild that will say, Hey, here's your success rate, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And, and that's pulling in that information, I'm sure. Yeah. And honestly, like, like places like go hunt and stuff, I, I mean, they give you a piece of it and your, your best information comes straight from the state. They, you don't yeah. have to pay for it. It's all out there, but you you have to do the work. Again, Americans yeah. we're 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 bred on convenience and, and laziness. So if somebody could charge you 150 bucks a year to put it right in front of you, you don't have to go looking for it. So people are going to buy it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and that's a great point too. Because even going back to what we were saying earlier of, of hunting specific states, and this is something I know for you, you know, like you were said, finally you're you're you have an idea of where you're going to start your season. It's not just a, all right, here I go. I might try this one and, and whatever, like go for either an out of state hunt or, or hunting here basically. Uh, but you know, that allows you that opportunity. But, you know, like you said, you do have to put that work in and the, at that state and it narrows it down. Do you know what I mean? So like if, instead of you saying, oh, I hope I could do Colorado, I might, I'm not sure if I'll do a, say an over the counter elk tag or, you know, uh, we might try to do a Nebraska hunt. Like what's the success rate going there? Something along those lines where you, you're looking at multiple states and trying to draw that information. And uh, now that you're able to 
you know, you know where exactly where you're going. You might, this is your big out of state hunt. Now you could just focus on that. And, and that's, and that's critical. And like you said, that most information you're going to get is actually from the state resources and you just have to have, sit down, have a plan and, you know, and, and go f from there, like look at it and see what your options are and continue to build on and, uh, go and grow and grow and grow and see all that, that right information that you're looking for, uh, success rate and along those lines and the rules and regs and all that type of stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, man, well, let's kind of, let's kick it off. Okay. So let's, let's kick this one off to th this discussion of you, you got your, your idea. So do you think it would be a good time to maybe prioritize like which ones you're hoping to draw? Like you said, you tried to dr draw this one two years ago. I know you're putting in for Iowa, all that type of stuff, but like you may just be getting that preference point. Right. So mm -hmm. like, do you go into the, the winter months of like, okay, next year, I really hope this is the one I'm going to try to draw. And then everything else will be a preference point because I know there's like, I didn't know up until what, like a year or two ago that even if you were to draw, you could sell some of them back or get a preference point or something along those lines. And uh, I know you could speak probably a little bit more into detail about that. So like, mm -hmm. let's go back to even that process of like January hits, you know, deadlines are, are approaching. When, when do you narrow down? Like, that's the tag I hope I pull. Yeah, I I think it's a it's a good starting point. And what's kind of my process is a little bit different just due to the fact that I wanted Colorado so bad, right? My guy, this was something I was trying for year year after year, so it was my highest priority. So everything was stemmed around that. But you could start looking at um, you know all these states kind of have their. Uh, due dates and their their draw dates kind of spread out where you could kind of start to set up okay if I don't get this one let's kind I of apply to that one before it closes and then the results will be out before this one closes and I could apply for this one so you have to really start to like map out what your game plan is because <laughs> like Idaho is December 1st what's kind so of you want to you want to try and get in the it's it's not a draw, but it is a, a lottery. What's kind it's of essentially it's a queue, right? What's kind of and you get placed in line. But if what's kind so, of so you know you, if you wanted Idaho, you know December first, you got to be in line, and you may be sixty thousandth in the queue. And by the time you get a turn, eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours later, nothing's going to be there that you ever wanted. So now you're you're waiting for Idaho's next next um, leftover draw. Okay, so then, um, you yep, know, Utah, Colorado, they kind of open up in uh, April. Uh, I think Utah might be a little bit earlier. Um, their results come out earlier. So, again, you can always kind of, you got to, like, lay over when is the deadline, when am I going to hear about the draw result, and Let's then kinda... start to prioritize from there. So <laughs> my plan of attack last year was Colorado's priority. If I don't draw Colorado here's all the dates of leftovers that come back out. What's and kind of, you guys probably remember my Chinese fire drill. Like I, I really wanted to go, I was working hard on, on myself, like physically to what's get kind in of, shape. I was, I was going to go somewhere like that was just it. So, but my, as soon as I missed Colorado, it was like, okay, now I'm sitting on Nevada leftovers. I'm sitting on Idaho's leftovers. I'm sitting on uh, Colorado's leftovers. I tried to grab, and I was unsuccessful, like five or six draws before I finally got color or Idaho. Somebody returned a tag for Idaho's last draw. And I think it That's was right. like literally a, a month before the season started. What's uh, kind of so we talk about, well, I got all this time now and I know what's going on. So like this is this is a little new to me because usually it's just a crapshoot in, in Tim's life but when it comes to Sean <laughs> tag. So um what you were saying before is you, there are some states that, um, if you surrender the tag early enough from the time you draw it, you could get refunded. You could get your preference points back. It's more often than not that you still lose your preference points. Like I know Colorado, um, the year I killed my elk, I actually drew Colorado and I was, something was telling me to go back into that one area and go for elk and, um, so I actually gave my tag back. You you lost your preference point, you know, whatever preference points you had to draw it. But um, so, yeah, they're all a little bit different. But if you 
are des if you are desperate to hunt the West and you you don't have a particular state that you're just going to focus on, um, you really have to lay out the calendar starting in December, like before December 1st when Idaho starts. And a lot of these through January, a lot of these get approved at the board meetings of when these when these dates are finalized, you know, at the at the state meeting. So, so um, let's kind of it could be you know you you got to look at last year's and just hope that they all stay the stay the same. You know, look at what week. Let's kind of that they were all they were all done there, and and then start there. I mean, that's your best bet. Or you know, let's kind of hunt that you're that you got good odds to draw if you don't want to take the risk of not drawing. You know, that's the right. other. That's the other. You know, with the preference points that I had. I could have guaranteed myself a tag in, let's say, a lesser unit or a different type of hunt, but I wanted to do this above ten thousand foot hunt, you know, in early September. What's kind of? I was kind of left at, you know, the the odds that were ever in my favor, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot, man, and I think a lot of people that are, I, I mean, to be completely even blunt, for me, like that's just one aspect for me where it's like, man, I. I've gone on record the last couple of years of saying, luckily for me, I haven't had a chance to get that elk bug. You know, we haven't done that. And I did kind of get that, that mule deer bug where that was fun and just seeing the West and knowing what's out there. And man, I, it just, it's beautiful. I just, I wish obviously my new life situation with, with the baby kind of throws a little wrench in, into that plans for this year. Uh, but I kind of told, told, the wife, when you pulled out one, I just kind of said, you know, just so you know, like, uh, not 24, but 25, like I'm pulling that Iowa tag. Like I'm finally yeah. going to do that. And just so you know, what's uh, kind of, it, I'm blocking what's kind of October or and potentially end of October, but for sure, November, like two weeks. I'm yeah, two weeks in the like summer two, too. You got to buy. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. So I'm like, you know, there's going to be two, like two week blocks uh, during that time frame and she was started giving me crap and she's like well that means you're not going to tack you're not doing man and i was like well shit I, I still am i said i was trying to explain the 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 uh the allure of this and and uh everything like that but it is man dude it is a lot and for me it's kind of like a i don't want to say a turn off but it's just i'm just like man you know like you you gotta have points and you gotta spend the money to do all that stuff and I mean, like I said, luckily for me, luckily for me, my desire right now is still, what's uh, kind of, I want to go to New York with you guys. I want to do Ohio. I want, like, it's still the whitetail, um, mm -hmm. which I hope, you know, maybe, maybe starting now, knowing that in a couple of years when, when I'll be able to have a little bit more quote unquote freedom to get out West and do those things, I'm thinking like this will be the year where I'll, I'll start putting putting some, uh, some money aside and putting some points away, you know, hopefully to be like, all right, what, what can we do maybe in three years, guys, you know, right. what, what's something that we want to do and, uh, do something along those lines. So that's where, that's where I'm at with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, I mean, I think that that's a, a good segue into like that, leading how, into now. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, that's how it kind of, um, lays out for me too. Like you have all these points mm -hmm. everywhere. So now, you know, different species, different states, and now you have to start planning, especially if you want to hunt with somebody. Like Tom and I, we have a couple points in certain states lined up. Um, obviously, us with hopefully we'll be drawing Iowa with you. You know, so mm -hmm. like you got to kind of look at the whole gamut of when, oh. <laughs> what do I hunt and when, and then you got to put. Yeah, you you really have to put yourself in the best odds to draw if that's the if that's your plan going forward. So right. it. It makes things like you almost have to plan three years out. Like I'm gonna have, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have like eight or nine preference points on elk in Colorado after this year. So like, when do I want to cash that in? Is that two years? Mm -hmm. Is that three years? Start looking at hunts that you know are huh. of good quality right now, and then plan for that. You know, come 2026, we're gonna do an elk hunt in Colorado. Yeah, right. So it it is though. It it's it's a whole nother level of, of management. And like you're talking about the whitetail bug and, and that's a good place to be right now because the West is threatened. I don't care what you say. The West Western hunts are threatened, especially if you're non non-resident that, you know, a lot of them, they're cutting back allocations to non-residents in every state. We had a bad winter kill on pronghorn 
and mule deer in Wyoming uh, and Colorado two years ago. So the fact, you know, it's, we're sitting here talking about how hard it was for me to draw a tag. That's not even like a super premium tag. Um, Mm -hmm. So that you got to build that into the equation too, that, you know, there's not a whole lot of opportunity out there for non-residents anymore, unless you're buying points, you're buying time and you're just waiting your turn. The the days of the days of picking up and just going over the counter to any state, you know, Colorado's even talking about going to points and draws for everything, you know, that taking away the elk mm-hmm. over the counter, you know, so it's just going to get harder and harder. Whitetail, fortunately, we have those couple high quality states that, you know, you got to wait a couple of years for, but uh, it's nothing compared to what you can possibly be dealing with out West in, in the next few years. <clears throat> yeah. That's tough, man. Like, like you said, I mean, I would love, I would love the one day go hunt hunt uh go stop my own go stalk on a on a antelope and be along a fence row or something like that and down by mm-hmm. water like just stuff like that it's just like how open that is like that that would be something i would like to do and i would love to go after mule deer again one day and for sure just obviously say i, I want to hear an elk bugle out while i'm out hunting and all that type of stuff but yeah. no nah, man that's 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 a good good start and so now like here we are today. You found out yesterday. You got your tag. Now what? So it's a couple things right off the bat. Um, it's, huh. you know, you talk about gear all the time. And I'm, I nerd out on, on whatever you need for Western hunts when it comes to gear. So first thing is, what do I need now? Um, mm-hmm. you know, you've mentioned, you know, you've been doing this for 10 years, but it's still that refinement. Things that work, things that didn't work. You know, I went through Idaho last year. Um, it was somewhat of a quick hunt. You know, I didn't, I wasn't back there for a week. Um, but there are things that, you know, I got to replace or things that were just a little bit clunky in execution. And, you know, maybe it's time to spend the money and upgrade some piece of gear. So, um, I started going, like I used my notes app and I just started going through, like, as things are coming to my head, whether I was, you know, Huh. doing anything throughout the day it's like oh crap i should probably get something like that you know so mm-hmm. gear gears first um and along with the gear um comes the physical fitness and i can't stress that enough you can't you can't cheat the mountains out there um so i've been on a pretty hard um regiment for the past year of you know changing my diet working out and trying to cut weight um, trying to build, it's, it's not even muscle, it's endurance. Um, mm-hmm. so it's you know, last year I got in shape as much as I could for Idaho. I've hunted it before, so I kind of knew what was expected. So I, you know, but this, this is a whole different level. Um, you know, I'll be, there's peaks in this area that I want to check oh. out. That's between 12, all the way up to 14,000 feet. Um, so that just adds another element to it. Uh, so the physical fit, fitness part, you know, I've been working on from the beginning of the year. Um, I've been, like I said, I changed my diet. I went to like a high protein, high fat diet, um, cut the carbs out. I uh, did the carnivore for a couple of weeks straight, which felt amazing. Huh. Felt horrible for like two, three days. And then as soon as you ke- hit that ketosis stage, man, it was like the best I felt in a long time. So nice. I huh. stuck with not to that insanity amount, but. I stuck with that high fat, high protein diet now. Um, so now it's just, I got to shred a couple. I got like, I lost 20 pounds within the last year. So I got seven more to go. Um, so I'm planning to try and shred that in the next month. And then it's just refinement and building endurance. Nice. Yeah. So when you look, when you look at the gear and like you're saying, you're going on your notes tab and everything like that on your phone and you think back to what you did in Idaho, what are some of the things that now you're like, okay, that was a little clunky and, and to some things, aspects of it, uh, that you want to refine in your gear setup. Yeah. Oh. So, um, my tent is number one. So I look at where I can cut weight. Um, cause with this type of hunt, um, so for like oh. a seven day backpack hunt for me, I can be anywhere between like 32 to 35 pounds. Um, oh. and that's comfortable for me. So now my thought I'm, I'm looking at, so I have a, I have a whole spreadsheet, so I recommend this to anybody that is hard into gear and hard into planning hunts. 
Um, I went through my entire, I have a whole room dedicated to my hunting stuff. And so it's very easy for me to just set up a scale and pull out literally every piece of gear. And I ran a spreadsheet and weighed every piece of, of huh. hunting equipment that I own from, you know, a lighter to light your stove to huh. the uh, huh. cut off handle toothbrush all the way up to, you know, your tent, your pack, everything else. So and like I mentioned before, like I, I, I try and be a minimalist. Um, so huh. I basically made this spreadsheet and category categorized everything from, you know, here's your sleep system. Here's your pack system. Um, here's your weapon system. Here's your kill kit. Um, and broke everything huh. out into these categories, identify what their weight is. Um, and then as you just choose these things, it adds everything up for you and gives you pretty much your total pack weight. Um, so my plan now is to go back through that. And I started looking at things of like, okay, where can I cut weight? Cause I know I can run 35 pounds. No problem. Um, that's obviously without me, <clears throat> um, huh. but I've got to make up whatever weight I cut. I got to make up in water because huh. I get those elevations. If there is no snow, there's not going to be much water up there. So my plan is if I can cut six, seven pounds, that means I can take six or seven pounds of more water with me. <clears throat> before I have to okay. come back down to a lower elevation. So um, huh. right now uh, I need to upgrade my tent. So huh. I run a, a Nemo two person tent. Um, it's great. Huh. I like it. Um, I actually invested. Huh. I only got, it took it on the Idaho um, hunt, but it is, you know, four and a half to five pounds. Um, and I know for a little bit of money, I can get that tent system down to like two and a half pounds. If I go with right. an ultralight tent. So right. I'm looking at the Argali two person that just came out. I, and that's probably I was just the gonna say I'm gonna go. <laughs> Yep. I was just exactly I, as you were saying that I was just typing in Argali just to to see what that uh the weight uh, is of their new their new tent system because that looks pretty slick. Yeah. Um I'm gonna end up getting the insert with it, even though the insert's like another uh, I don't know, twenty two ounces or something, but um it's just worth it to feel that you know the weather conditions in this area could, you know, when you're at that elevation, you could be in mm -hmm. snow one day and 70 degrees the next day. So, okay. so I'm going to go with the insert. It's a little bit more money, a little bit more weight, but it'll be, it's kind of this balance between comfort and you know, huh. ultra light. <clears throat> so there's certain things I like to be that I'm okay being uncomfortable with. There's other aspects that I, I don't care. I'm just going to carry the extra pound or two. Mm -hmm. um, so I may go to a quilt. So right now I run, I run a sleeping bag. Um, it's not a mummy bag. It's basically a rectangular sleeping bag that my, uh, huh. my pack huh. fits right in. It's kind of nice, but I'm a, I, I toss and turn. So me getting wrapped up into a sleeping bag and zipped in there doesn't, doesn't go over too well throughout the night. So I might look into going catabatic with a quilt. Um, which is pretty much just like having a nice down blanket with you. So it gives me that freedom to, to move around and, and hopefully get some better sleep. Huh. Um, huh. The spawning scope. So that's another thing that, you know, I, I have some really good binoculars, but I think on a hunt like this where I'm going to be, um, it's huh. going to be a lot of glassing. These above alpine basins uh, huh. where, you know, you're pretty much sitting all day. And getting as right. as much as a as a panoramic view as you can to try and find deer. So, um, I'll be huh. looking into investing in probably a better spotting scope than what I use right now. This spotting scope that I have right now, I just use at the range. I you know if I right. glass around here for anything, I take my I take my big pinox. But <clears throat> huh. so I haven't really decided on that one yet. But that's that's going to probably be uh, of everything that'll be the largest investment for this hunt. <clears throat> but it's right. an investment. It's not. It's not a one and nine. For someone like yourself, dude, you're, you're, you're doing year after year, we're doing some sort of, you're doing some sort of, of hunt, like of this magnitude of whether it even be for whitetail or something along those lines. So for that, that piece of equipment will pay for itself as the years go on as well. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about the, the glassing, um, effort when that we went we, that, yeah, went for, for in, even back here for whitetails and it's like, Hey, maybe it's worth getting into that. Like, get huh. that spotting scope through June into July when the whitetails are and get used to that and get out. And, you know, 
I have the attachment on the on the phone that you could throw right on the lens, and it'll be fun to even just use it for whitetail, you know, as opposed to just mm-hmm. running binoculars. So, <clears throat> um, so that yeah, that one, it's just you know, with the price of them to get a get a good high quality one, it's it's an investment. <clears throat> yeah. Um, huh. If you know boots, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this, but like I came down with plantar fasciitis, like. Mm-hmm. I want to say maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago, and it was one of the worst things that I've dealt with. Um, so I'm not an orthopedic, but it's pretty much when um, like the tissue underneath your heel bone starts to break down and you really get a lot of bone contact on the bottom of your feet. And it, it really just, it, it swells up and it, it's basically just super painful to walk. So yeah, um, I started to question myself like why I was getting it and it, you know, I lived half my childhood in, in skate, in hockey skates, um, and still do. So I think that's part of it. Um, <laughs> but I'm also like, I've been heavy on, on shoes, like my entire life. Like that's just, I'm always on my feet. So, um, you know, it got to a point where I was basically ice on my feet every night just to pull down the swelling to lose the pain. So worked really hard to do some measures to get rid of that because that's like the worst thing that could happen on a hunt like this. Like, you can't hike, you ain't going to be successful. It just comes down to that. So, so I invested in, I tried probably a dozen different types of insoles over the years. I finally found a company that, you know, I has an insole that works really well for me and that has helped relieve that. Um, I will say like the saddle has worsened it. Um, that was the only, and that was just a personal thing. Cause that's your point of contact, right? Is like right. your bottom of the foot heel on the platform all day. Um, and because I always stood on my platform, I never used one of those angled platforms. Um, right. so, huh. you know, I huh. overcame that this year, you know, I, I, I got the swelling down. I think I resolved the issue, um, without having to go through surgery or anything like that. So, um, everything's good now. So like when I ran the saddle this year, I really didn't have, have any pain. So, but it's something that is in the back of my mind that I got to take extra care of, Huh. good boots and good insoles and make sure, you know, I have good balance the whole time I'm hiking because, you know, that's the last thing that you want to happen. So right. I try a bunch of different companies. There's some that's worked. There's some that hasn't worked. Um, the best ones that I've found that work for my feet right now are, are your Scarpas. So huh. I'm looking to yeah. probably invest in a new pair of Scarpas. <clears throat> um, and then huh. the one is optional, but I am considering a rifle chassis. Um, like a folding rifle chassis for my for my weapon, um, just due to the mm-hmm. fact that I use a seven mag usually um, mm-hmm. for Western hunts, and you know it's it's a long gun, so it's more it's more so just for packability. But yeah, right. you have to start laying out budget as well. Like, what's this hunt going to cost me? Um, which we can get there too. Um, right. So all these things start working because again, you can't go broke trying to do this just because you bought a tag. It's not like all of a sudden, okay, I'm just gotta go drop five grand. You know. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so before b- before you do that though, what's the one thing where you said like you are okay with being uncomfortable with certain things? Where does what is that for you? And obviously that's a personal thing, right? So like for you, what is what is that? Where are you okay with being uncomfortable at? I, th- I think it goes back to this minimalist. Like there's certain mm-hmm. things that I think a lot of people take on hunts that, you know, it's just like, I know people that have taken like mini chairs to sit on at the end of the night, or they take a different pair of shoes or all kinds of things um, that just provide that little extra relief or extra comfort. And I don't do any of that. Like if I got to I'm going to stand and be sitting on the ground for eight days straight. That's fine. Like, it took a lot of me just to take a glassing pad for the first time last year. I've never even taken a glassing pad. It's just like, I'll dig a hole and, you know, make sure my, my fanny's comfortable in that hole, <laughs> you know, for a couple <laughs> hours. So like just certain things like that, that I just, um, that's where I try and I could, I could feel like I'm, I'm uh, like, I could be uncomfortable. What, what I don't like, um, to sacrifice in is my pack. My pack needs to be good. It needs to perform, especially when there's a hundred pounds on your back and you got 10 right. miles to go. Um, so the pack has to be good in good shape. Um, obviously the boots have to be in good shape. Um, but that's really it. The rest of the things like I'm okay to skimp on, um, a little bit here and there. Um, obviously sleep is important, but 
you know, you take enough pills and you can knock out for the night too. And <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. I like that. Well, what, what's, uh, what's next on the list? Where are we at then? So, um, I start looking into budgeting, right? So now I got to start planning, planning the trip. Um, so this is something that, um, it ties back in with, um, scouting of where you're going to hunt to. So I got, I got the whole wilderness basically, um, that wilderness crosses multiple units. So it is a pretty big area. Um, and there's only 40 tags and I think only 10% are, have gone to non-residents. So I'm in pretty good, pretty good shape in terms of, um, hunter, hunter pressure. I don't think I'm going to see much of, um, okay. but we start talking about, you know, I'm, it's a 27 hour drive, 28 hour drive, something like that. So start plan budget so that you can financially plan for it if, if you haven't already, you know, um, and then with that, you start identifying through that whole next process is where are you going to hunt? Um, right. So my biggest thing is, um, you know, I'm planning to drive, I'm doing this solo. So I'm planning to drive this again, you know, um, planning to bring my rooftop tent. So other people that don't have a rooftop tent, um, they may sleep in the truck, they may grab a hotel. So now it's like, okay, what legs can I do? You know, I try and max myself out when I did Idaho, which was 40, 41 hours from my driveway to the trailhead. I, I mean, I did two back to back 16 hour drives. Um, so I'll probably, I'll probably break this up in two or three legs. It all depends. It all depends if I'm going to plan to work, um, during the drive or not, not during the mm -hmm. drive, but like work, drive, sleep, you know, work, drive, sleep, or if I'm just going to drive the full thing. Um, so mm -hmm. you start budgeting, what's it going to cost for gas? I'll save money and I'll identify public areas that I can camp at, um, with the rooftop tent. So I save a bunch of money there. Um, obviously there's your license fee that has come into it now. You know, you start planning food for the way out. So typically what I do is, you know, buy a bunch of snacks or you make sandwiches behind the wheel and just eat as you drive and keep moving. Only stop to use the restroom. That's pretty much it. Um, so you can, you can be very budget friendly where my expenses going out is upfront groceries and gas and that's it. And I can be 40 in Colorado for less than a couple hundred bucks, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, 40, start planning out what you, what you got to take, you know, how many coolers are you going to take? You know, what else needs to go? I'm going to obviously leave the e-bike at home. There's no vehicles allowed in the wilderness areas. So, um, that's not going to provide me any benefit, but really starting to hone in kind of what the majority of the truck items are, which, you know, <clears throat> I split out all those truck items on my spreadsheet too, because it makes everything easy. You just go right down mm -hmm. the list, need this, need this, don't need this, need that. Um, so at the same time, I'm running through budget and all the expenses I'm going to come across on the way. Um, I, you know, I take it all the way down to, you know, what could possibly be a bag of ice or two cost out in Colorado, you know, before I, before I head back into the trailhead, I always throw as much ice as I could in the cooler just to get the cooler cold. Um, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you come back two, three days and you have meat that, you know, you've just been hiking back in 70 degree weather, you can get that as cold as, as possible. You don't have to wait to go back into town. So just things like that, that you know that you're going to have to buy. <clears throat> and some people, right. maybe they don't, they don't run the budget. I like to do it because I like, I like to compare it to like, okay, where can I, where can I improve this? Where could I cut money? Um, right. So I know when we went to Utah, we were, we were identifying everything as we went, okay, gas this much, mm -hmm. you know, snacks mm -hmm. this much. We ate out. It was this much, you know, whatever it was. And so you can keep that running tally and see where you can cut costs. If that becomes, if, if that's going to allow me to hunt every year, then it's worth me tracking it and trying to improve it. Right. To, so, to, to build on that for you too, Tim, I mean, for my first time going out west and that was my first really out of state hunt uh where i was the adult and i was in charge basically of, of my own being you made that so easy that spreadsheet and i can't stress that enough like even if i'm sure there's somewhere like on rock slide or somewhere where someone has something where you could just download their file or something like that or or like a, a copy of it in a sense but even if not, like if you get that rolling, man, it is 
that was instrumental for me. And even going on to the budget side of things, Tim, like that helped me out tremendously because it was like, okay, when I did summer school type stuff, I get paid extra. I was like, okay, so here's what, here's what this is going towards that. And dude, it was like spot on. Like you said, of handling the gas situation, we were like, okay, you know, Dimitri drove. So it was like, you and I split the costs of, of the gas and okay, you got this one. I got that one. We got this one. I got that one. And we just tallied that up. And, um, obviously for us, we did a different style of hunt than what we thought originally we we're going to be going out there, but then we were prepared for it though, as well. Um, and 40. it, it just, it just made a lot of. Uh, made my life a lot easier for a first time doing it. And I'm sure even since then, man, you've probably even refined it here and there, small bits and pieces. But so if you're, if you are looking to do this, uh, man, I'm telling you right now, some sort of spreadsheet is going to be a lifesaver for you with, within this department. Jer Jeremy, I, like that one that I sent you, that was one that I used from the beginning. And I, mm -hmm. this past, um, so previous to last year's Idaho hunt, I, I spent hours on it and I've refined this thing. So I am more than happy to share it with you and you, we can okay. throw it on one drive and you could post yep. a link and let it, yeah. let anybody use it. I mean, I'm not going to keep it, keep it to myself, but anybody can right, right. Ed edit it, see the equipment that I use, edit it for their own, you know, change up the weights and they can, they can start to plan out their Western right. hunts That's using awesome. it. Cause it, yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Um, so, forty. You know, one, once we get the budget figured out, once I get the plan figured out of kind of you know where where are you going to sleep on the way, when are you going to travel, you know, you put the vacation days in, you, you get all that stuff knocked out right out of the way because that's mm -hmm. that's pretty much not going to change, right? Mm -hmm. um, what could change is your conditions of where you're hunting, um, and also yeah. forty access. So. That's a big one. Um, I'm up in the air right now as to is it worth 40. me going out there in August and taking a long weekend and just us taking the trip out and, um, you know, just hiking up in the mountains, you know, going to a couple glassing points that I have identified and just sitting there for, you know, going up for a long weekend, you know, two nights, mm -hmm. check around, see if you could put eyes on a good buck and keep tabs on since you'll be back in less than a month kind of thing. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm between taking a trip and doing that. Or just, um, you know, going out two days early, um, getting in there two, two days before the season, taking my time, hiking in somewhere, making sure I'm not getting myself in trouble, you know, with deadfall or anything like that. I can get up to where I want. The biggest thing with this hunt is um, the worst part is going to be getting to that elevation. So I'm probably looking at a four to 5,000 elevation climb. Um, but those last couple, th those first couple thousand feet is going to be through yeah. where you're going to be bushwhacking through deadfall. And, and that's going to be the worst part. So once you're up above the Alpine, it'll be fine. Um, but, you know, we're really trying to identify, you know, where can I use a trail? Even if the trail is an extra mile, if I stay on it, can I shorten my, my trek to get above Alpine? You know, so just Got starting it. to look at things like that. <clears throat> 40. Um, Obviously, since I've been looking at this um, for a couple of years, I a lot of my e-scouting is is tuned and prepped. Like I was planning mm -hmm. to do this hunt, so like I've already identified glassing spots. I've already identified um, quite a bit. What I'm going to work on is trying to figure out what what kind of mileage could I cover in a day in in areas like this, so that if I'm going to plan for hunting the whole eight day season. Um, what is that, what is the best route look like for me to not have to back backtrack? So Got where it. can I go from point A to point B and almost, almost make a loop, you know, in those eight days so that I'm seeing all new country the whole time. I can check areas off as I go. If I'm not seeing, you know, deer at all, or I'm not seeing a good buck, you know, move to the next one, move to the next one, move to the next one. Just so I'm not wasting downtime, you know, and try and stay hunting as long as you can. Um, you know, and the physical fitness part comes into that because there's times where like, you know, you're four or five days into this, you're solo, your mental game is everything. And you could talk yourself out of a lot of things real quick. So <clears throat> no doubt. Um, so that e-scouting part, I think my curve is shortened on that. Obviously, I'm going to refine that as much as I could now, knowing that this mm -hmm. is real in three and a half months. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
through the summer now this is a new game for me um you know most of the areas that i've hunted mule deer with the rifle in the past have been um, previous burn areas that have been you know that seven to eight thousand foot range um but i was all you know every mule deer that i've taken with the rifle out west has been under 200 yards you know so i've never right. had i never had the tag that would put me in this above alpine situation um because it just didn't exist for the tags that i've had um so now i could be looking now it's like okay tim how how long do you want to take a shot where do you feel comfortable um, so now I got to start practicing for that. <laughs> right. So, you know, I feel comfortable with, with my weapon right now at 300, is 300 enough. It might not be, you know, it right. might be, I want to be five, 600, you know, and then again, you know, now it's investment on, on the ammo side. I mean, you know, do I want to, mm-hmm. do I want to reload? Do I want to just buy stock ammo? Which one's going to perform? Um, yeah. And, and really calculate those five, 600 yard distances that if it comes down to this, um, you know, I'm not going to take a shot where I don't feel comfortable. Um, but mm-hmm. if that's, if I get into a situation where there's no way I'm cutting distance and it's now or never, then I, I will also want to be prepared for it. Nice. Um, so that's got to happen through that. You know, that's my learning curve, I think, um, because I'm not, you're up in Pennsylvania. I'm not a long range guy. <laughs> right. You know, so. Um, yeah, they, they, they're pretty much the biggest things that are on, uh, 40, on my plate. And there's, yep. um, there's going to be some food prep. So I do a lot of my own meals. Um, so I dehydrate my own meals. So certain meals that I could just make at home now, you could, we could plan to make that for dinner and then take the leftovers, dehydrate it, vacuum seal it. And then that's a meal for me out West. You know, it's another way to cut, cut money out of out of the hunt too, instead of paying, I don't even know what they are. Like, you know, that's a, yeah. Heather's choice or a mountain house or whatever is probably like 12 to 15 bucks a peak, meal now. Yeah. So peak, peak, peak re- refuel, man is, I mean, it's good stuff, but it's, it's expensive. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk, you know, if you're going to plan for eight days, uh, you know, you're, that's another hundred to 150 bucks just in, just in food, you know? So, right. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty much the biggest things that are on my mind right now. Um, obviously we've never been in this area. Um, so looking at access to where I want to get to is going to be big. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so I'll utilize, you know, certain aerial maps. So a lot of hiker, um, information that's out there, like websites and blogs and companies that run a lot of hiking trails and stuff. Um, you know, with this area, there are some. Some, uh, there's some areas around the area that are advantageous for, for hiking. So, um, yeah, you know, I'll be able to use those resources to see, okay, where can we get to? What, what could be possibly closed if a storm does roll through here, you know, mm-hmm. just to, you know, that's why I'd want to go early too. If I don't make that scouting trip, cause I would right, right. like, imagine what Utah would have been for us if we would have went out there, you know, a, a, a couple of weeks beforehand and just. Oh drove gosh. around be like oh yeah this is gonna be completely different this is where we should hunt and it probably would have been more productive so well, yeah <clears throat> so i so would say either when... go ahead i was just gonna say you even go in in so much into detail with rainfall 40... and you look at the snow like yeah like how you were saying like you you touched yeah. upon it earlier of like oh if there's gonna be snow up there obviously it will be great for water if there's no more mm-hmm. snow up there you're gonna have to potentially go down in a couple of days but like you start, you, you backtrack to see what this year was like in that area and what it continues to be moving up until the day you go and hunt. Right. Yeah. It's funny you say that. Cause, um, in my weather app that I use on my phone, this, uh, the closest town for this unit has been in my phone for like three years. <laughs> so like, you know, every time you go on and check the weather, I see, you know, the Colorado weather and it's like, Oh, all right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, weather plays a huge deal. When you have a migrating, when you're chasing a migrating species, I mean, weather's everything. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, was it, was there a lot of water? You know, is antler growth going to be better than usual? Because, again, that's another thing. Like, um, if they have a poor year and, you know, there's not a whole lot of water, not a lot of early growth um, in the vegetation, and, you know, Mm -hmm. they're not going to have time to grow antlers. Um, I'm not saying to a point where they're going to, not have antlers. I'm just saying to a point that, you know, 
that 170 inch mule deer may not go to 180, 190. He may stay at that 170 mark, which, right. And obviously, 170 is on going to be on my radar. But to give you an example, like you know, you could be looking at it. You could be chasing a certain trophy class on a hunt that the weather didn't allow for that trophy class to get to that level. Got uh, it. Now that that's to the extreme. That's to, on like an extreme level. But you also have to be if you're chasing already what's going to be a 10% quality throughout the area, you know, and you had a bad year, that 10% quality may be down to, you know, 5%. And that, right. that, may, 40, that, that means your efforts now need to be twice as, twice as strong. So mm-hmm. it, having that historic data um, and keeping tabs on the conditions of the, of the weather and of that area out there is, is in, in my mind, super important. Yeah, it's um, huge. You know, and I looked at this year, like this year was, I want to say it was a mild winter out there, but it wasn't a winter kill winter out there. And, uh, you know, that area got right at 100% of, 40, you know, their snowpack um, 40, mm-hmm. of what's usually anticipated there, which means good water and, you know, not a whole lot of winter kill. So it it's good condition right now for to be a good yeah. year for them. <laughs> nice. Anything you're worried about? Um, being solo. Yeah. I, yeah. There's always some worry back there. Like I've done it. I, most of my hunts out West have been solo at this point. Um, but yeah, it's always something in the back of your mind. You know, you, you go into these places that you've never been in. You, you have a satellite communicator, but, um, you know, the, it's always on the mind of, you know, can I get hurt? You know, that there's mm-hmm. super, it, there's decisions that I make, um, that are different when, I feel like when I'm by myself, then when I might be with a party, I might be a little bit more um, daredevilish. I guess you could per se. Like I think about like when uh, you took a shot of me out in Utah when I was like at the edge of this cliff, and it was like you remember that? <laughs> yep. I was, and, I was I was getting bricks when I took that photo. Yeah, and uh, you know that's not something that I would probably do if I was like on a hunt. I'm not going to go to the edge like this. You know, I'm not. Yeah. You know, but it's just those things in the back of your mind. It's like maybe I shouldn't jump off this deadfall because I could break my ankle. Yeah, you know, and then if I break my ankle, I'm five miles from my truck. What the hell am I going to do? So right. that's right. always like an added level, I think. Um, don't get me wrong. Like I would love to have you know, one of my best friends with me out there. Um, but I also know that everybody's got a life. It's extremely hard to draw tags. You got to have points. You got to like, you, you got to plan for this years and years in advance. Um, so I know like it's not, that's not probably not going to be possible. So, yeah. you know, I want to do it. I enjoyed the adventure, so I'm just going to do it by myself. Um, so that's definitely one thing I'm worried about. The other thing I'm a little worried. concerned about is just, um, you know, the overall condition of the herd, um, the herd is, you know, is in good condition. You know, there was that large winter kill that was kind of on the, on the edge of this area two years ago. So I'm a little bit, um, you know, it's in the back of my mind, you know, what, what is my expectation in terms of, right. um, sightings and forty quality, you know? Right. So you wait for a couple of years for this hunt or whatever, you know, you definitely want to give it all you got, but you definitely don't want to be put yourself in a position where you have this high level of, you know, what the expectation is and, you know, come day two or three and you haven't seen a deer yet, you know, being right. solo, that's something that you can mentally check out really quick. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That, that will definitely be up a little bit. You know what I mean? I mean, hell that was, uh, we're just even going to, uh, when 40. we went to Utah, just that little bit, we're one, one minute down the road in that world-class unit, we're seeing 200-plus yeah. yeah. inch mule deer, and then we're back on our unit, and we're like, hey, there's that spike. Let's go yeah. get them. That, that'll deflate, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, so last year on my on my mule deer hunt in Idaho, you know, I hunted that area previously a few times, and you know, there were times where I would see 30, 30 deer a day, you know, multiple bucks. Um, through these burn areas, through all these little ridges. And when I got up there last year, I'm like going from, from drainage to drainage to drainage throughout the entire first day. And it's just like void, void of deer. And I'm just like, this ain't right. Something's going on. So I ended up killing a, a, a decent buck. And, uh, you know, I got off the mountain and I took it to a, a taxidermist in town there. 
um, to send the Euro mount home. You know, I brought it in and he's like, you're the first one to bring me a, bring me a deer this year. And, uh, I said, hasn't it been good? He said, he said, they cold this entire area for CWD. And I didn't know that. Like, right. Yeah. You got a leftover tag. Yeah. Yeah. I got a leftover tag. I wasn't in that area in the last, since I shot my elk. So it was like three or four years. And, you know, I guess CWD was rapid. Yeah, I wasn't really watching this area because that was a last resort for me. So I wasn't really watching right. that area or really looking for news on, on what the condition of that, of that area was. But apparently they went through this whole thing with CWD. The herd got cold down like extremely. There wasn't many deer around. Um, 40, I was lucky enough to turn up a, a decent buck. And, 40, uh, but when I got out of there, it's like if I would have known that going into it, pfft, by yourself and not seeing not seeing many deer um i would have mentally checked out and turned it into some sort of vacation or something you know it, it's right. very hard to right. kind of stay engaged and stay in the game when when everything is fighting against you mentally <laughs> yeah yeah dude i like it i like that well i uh i'm trying to think even of like what else we could add to that because I mean, the physical side of things, let me ask you this, and, and I know we've talked about it before. It's been a while though. You know, when we went out to Utah and I've told people this, going into that hunt, I worked out, I did a little bit of strength, strength training, but I did more of like what you were saying, getting into the cardio, making sure I have the endurance. I hiked a lot. I had my backpack on. Like I remember we had uh, my dog at the time and, and Nora and everything like that. Every time we were, we would do something for a walk with the family. My pack was on and mm-hmm. I had some type of hiking boot on and maybe not, it wasn't my actual boot that I was going to use, but I just wanted to get familiar and, and, and have that, that little quote unquote weight on my feet. And going into it, Tim, I felt like I was, I could still, I look back at photos as far as physicality goes, man, I was in one of the better shapes of my life, uh, during that time frame. But for me, for some reason, it was only, it only happened in the morning. Whenever, whenever we would begin our hike and go somewhere in that morning, I just remember you and Dimitri just blowing past me, right? Like I can see Dimitri cause he's, you know, his legs are, he's taller. So his longer legs and he's get up there, but you and I are the same height and you were like blowing by me and I'm like sucking wind. I just remember being like, damn, like this, this sucks. It, it was just something about the morning, but then because then mid, midday and in the evenings or whatever like that, I'd be right there with you then. And mm-hmm. I didn't have that like sucking wind feeling. Uh, I just, I don't know if it was just like getting adjusted to the altitude. And I don't know if I really, I can't remember if, if it got better at all. But I just remember those first two or three that we did. Uh, I just remember being like, oh my gosh, like just sucking wind because of the altitude, I'm assuming. I don't yeah. know. It's just something different. I just always remember the mornings were rough, but every, all the other time during the day was perfectly fine for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not something I've ever experienced. Now I try and acclimate. I'm not the type of, um, you know, usually I'll plan to get to where wherever my trailhead is and, and sleep the night and acclimate. Mm-hmm at that elevation now yeah you may be a couple thousand feet above that or whatever but um i did go on a hunt with a with uh one of my buddies once that you know we got there as soon as we pulled in we were gone and that was it and you went from like you know 40 driving from let, leaving here at 2,000 feet getting into denver at 5,000, and then driving up to eleven thousand, and right throwing in five six miles hiking and he got out there <laughs> And yeah. I, I did not, like I was fortunate. I, I don't know what it is. Um, but yeah. yeah, I, I can definitely, um, I can definitely relate to, to that a little bit just in that, you know, it, it is a bodily change big time mm-hmm. and there is less oxygen in the air. So I'm, I'm, you, you asked me what I'm, what I'm concerned about. And I, 40, I guess 40, I, I need to do my own research cause you know, the, the nine, 40, 10,000 foot, I don't think is a big deal, but when you start going over 10, and you get up to that mm-hmm. 12 and 13 and even could be at 14,000 depending like there's less and less oxygen. So I may feel good on day one or two, but 40, if I yeah. don't come down and I don't sleep at a lower level, I could probably find myself in trouble days, days mm-hmm. later where that mm-hmm. energy, if that oxygen is just less and less over time, 
um, and your body's just, you know, it's going to shut down. So I, I am a little bit concerned about that. And it's just, I got to do more research, uh, on my own to figure, figure out, okay, if I'm going to glass here for the day, where should I camp about where should I camp and how far away is that going to be? What, you know, am I going to be dropping down a thousand feet, um, right. every night? Um, so yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely that in the back of my head too. <clears throat> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, dude, that's the, I, again, I just, uh, I don't know what it was. And it wasn't, I, luckily I didn't get sick. It just was, uh, yeah. I just remember being like, whew, like I just was slow. I wouldn't yeah. even say I was out of breath. I, maybe one, one of the days I did feel like I'm like, this isn't even an incline and I'm like out of breath a little bit, but I just remember being slow and that, that, that it surprised me. Cause I just remember being like, man, this is the best shape I've been in, in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think the approach was there, right? Like you got to, mm -hmm. you can't cheat the mountain, man. You, you, you got to go in there with, you got to do all the work up front to make sure like you are going to throw your, your best self at it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's times where, you know, especially coming out with meat on your back, if you, if you're lucky enough yeah. to like, like that's a whole different game. Cause now you got a hundred pounds plus on your back. So dude, that, your um, elk story too, you, you about killed yourself that year. Yeah, I mean those shoes were gone. Yeah, every everything hurt. Toenails were gone. Like it was that was a mess. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, <laughs> the mountains are going to kick your butt. No matter what you do, they're going to kick your butt. It's just how long are you going to be able to persevere? <laughs> getting your butt. Yeah. Back. How many how many rounds are you going to make it through? I guess. Yeah, that's that's when you need to have uh, be like Tony. Uh, what is it Tony? What's it? not Peterson, but. Uh, Ferguson, the UFC fighter, and have David Goggins train train how he trained him for his last fight or something. You need David Goggins up there just telling him what a big uh, <laughs> pussy you are. Just keep yeah, staying exactly. harsh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, I'm uh, gonna send you messages yeah. from the end reach and just tell you, just yell at me a little bit. Here, I'm slowing down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm slowing down. I need you. just no, nah, man, dude. I, congratulations again pulling that. I was so pumped for you. I just again just knowing for the last five years how much you you've been wanting this or like, Hey, I'm putting a point in and hopefully in a couple of years I could draw this. And then, like you said, you and you and Tom tried it together, got, got negative. And then you, you, we we're, you guys were thinking about going somewhere else and didn't pull that. Wasn't that for even for like a antelope hunt? Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we didn't like pull. swung and missed twice on that year. Yeah. Then, and then we were like, you guys were like, Hey, maybe Nebraska. And I was like, uh, I don't know if you guys want to do that. Did you check the weather and you're like, no, why? And then you looked, it was like 110 degrees. You're like, yeah, we're not going out there for that. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we backed out of that one. I think that was a yeah. good position, but yeah, that, yeah, that was so, a good decision. Well, if it's, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind. Like you mentioned, Hey, I, you know, I, I'd rat, I want to do an antelope on there. I want to chase mill deer again and yeah, pick your state and just eat the, eat the couple bucks it is a year and at least start mm -hmm. start collecting points for it because you know when you're finally ready to do that yeah. 45 six years down the down the way you know you might be able to draw a tag yeah and that's i think honestly i think that's the the biggest fear for people is that budget i really do and i think it was was once you really kind of put it in my head like dude just trust me you'll you you'll find a way and it's one with your that budget that we did it man it was almost like a thing where if we were to be able to do that hunt you could almost do that hunt year after year it's just a matter mm -hmm. of getting that time to go right uh and it was just that uh, you know uh, i look at i look what? at what's to come for iowa for for next year and i just like i because I, I like i said I'm telling my wife i want to take the two the two five day like 10 total days of actual hunting uh, hopefully or or more I was just like, it's this. And I'm like, do you realize though, how much this is actually going to end up costing? Like I'm not, and one, the cost, but then two, I'll, 40. I said, I'll be 45 until I get a chance to go again. You know what right. I mean? Like that's right. like, it's not like a, a every year thing, like a, going to Ohio or Maryland or New York or wherever it be type of ordeal. So, um, but if you, if you just, like you said, be smart a little bit and, uh, be okay with uh, not on your drive out there eating out every time you're hungry. Like that will, that will help you tremendously. And um, dude, I appreciate you wanting to share that your spreadsheet with, with me and, and the listeners. I think that's going to be good. So uh, what we'll do is I'll have that once I get it, 
from Tim. Uh, I'll, I'll obviously I'll make a post or something, but then I will be up on the website. Uh, that's where we'll, we'll, we'll post that one. So somebody could click on it, go to it uh, and do that because I'm telling you back what you even shared with me before that was extremely uh, valuable to me then. And I'm, I'm excited to see what you're doing for this. And it's even good for your, if you're not going anywhere, it's even great for what you have. And it's, it's a great uh, thing. Like what Tim was saying earlier, if you need to replace something or, you know, what's, Hey, all right, I'm going through my hunting gear. Like I'm looking forward to that this summer. I always do that one day where I, I put all my stuff away in a nice, nice, contain, nice containers. And then sometime in the summer, I'm like, okay, let's pull that back out. What, what did I beat the hell out of that? I might need another set of, or something along those lines. Like you saw me lugging that bow around Mount montage. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not easy on my equipment. And, uh, that's, that's, uh, you know, I do have to sometimes go through some pieces of gear more, probably more so than I would like to. Now it, it's definitely good practice. And, you know, it goes back to like, what, what's most important to you? What do you want out of that piece of gear? Like mm-hmm. I look at, um, uh, you know, let's take just like a sleeping bag. Like wh- what's more important? Is it warmth? Is it packability? Is it weight? And then, you know, you make your decision based on that around your budget, whatever it is. And then 40, the next time that you're going to replace that, you go back, you know, okay, what is important to me? Is it still weight? Right. Is it still packability? 40. Whatever it is. And then, but I, th- I think, you know, even for whitetail, it's helped me, you know, I went through all my saddle gear. I went through every piece of gear that I own. You know, I, I added into some type of category on this spreadsheet and just even when I like if we were go, going to Iowa, I can just go through that spreadsheet and just be like, here's all the things I need. And 40. that is my running checklist that I'm not going to forget anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. Dude, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing that. I think that's a great, great chance. You just pulled that tag. You you are finally successful pulling that dream hunt that you've been wanting to do and you know, what's the next steps? I, I'm because there's people out there that maybe haven't had a chance to to do that yet. And they've been calculating uh, those points for the last four or five years. And then now, boom, they got it. And they're like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, and yeah. you don't you don't like you said earlier, Tim, you don't have to spend five thousand uh, dollars extra on top of your eight hundred dollar tag. Right. Like you can you can get away with being within a budget and not having to be in a hole for the next couple of years and not wanting to do that again. So definitely, definitely, uh, hopefully you, you t- take some of, of Tim's words on that one and, and man, I appreciate you coming on. Like always, brother, it's, it's just always good to see your face, hear your voice and, and listen and share your wisdom because I always learn. That's for, that's for, uh, for sure. I appreciate 40. you having me, man. It's always good to catch up with you. Absolutely. 40, thank you. Man. Well, <laughs> Yeah, dude, anytime. Uh, make sure you go check out Eastern Backcountry, right? Did I get it right? You got it. Yeah. 40. That a boy. I like it. Go check him out on Instagram and hit him up with any questions. I'm sure he'll answer or hit me up and I could ask him. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in, for watching, for listening, for the support. And uh, we'll see you next week. Antler up.